asked me this morning, are you nervous? I was a pastor in Cope for 30 years. I am a recovery, I mean retired pastor. <laughs> and I am nervous every time I get up to speak just because Testing, one, two, yeah, it's on. Just because of the seriousness of teaching God's word. You always want to do your best. You always want to make sure that, that you're true to it, that, that you rely on the Holy Spirit instead of your own power. So, grab your Bible, if you would, please, and turn to James chapter 1. I'm just going to grab a verse out of context, and we're going to read it, and we're going to go from there. Verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, and he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. There's a woman who rushed in to see her doctor one morning, and she was worried. I mean, this lady was all strung out, and she said, Doctor, take a look at me. I woke up this morning. I looked at myself in the mirror. I saw my hair was all wiry and frazzled up. My skin was wrinkled and pasty. My eyes were bloodshot and bulging out. I had this corpse-like look on my face. Doctor, what's wrong with me? The doctor looked at her for a few minutes, and finally he said, Well, I can tell you one thing. There's nothing wrong with your eyesight. <laughs> How do you start your mornings? Many of us, if not all of us, start our mornings with one of these. And we come to it, and we look at it, and, and we look and see, oh, yeah, yeah, not too bad today, Terry. Uh, how about you? I, from my perspective, you're all looking pretty good, okay? We look at that, that tool and... and we try to determine what needs to change, what could be made better. Should I shave this morning? Should I comb my hair? I always tell people I comb my hair once a day, whether it needs it or not. We want to make ourselves look presentable to the people around us. If we're honest, we'll admit that's a good thing, you know? It would be sad to look and then walk away without changing a thing. I mean, let's face it, folks, we haven't done that mirror any favors. So as we look at God's word, what I want you to see is that this is a mirror. It says so right there in James chapter 1. This is a mirror, and I don't know about you, but I come to it, and I look into it, and the question I ask myself is, okay, Lord, what needs to change? What can be improved on? How can I, and this, this is key to this morning, folks, how can I look more and more like you? I mean, isn't that the goal, folks? To look more and more like Jesus Christ? Shouldn't that be our goal? Yeah. Romans chapter 12. Verse 1 says, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. The world around us is trying to conform us into its image, to make us look like, like them. 
And God is working from the inside out. The world, world is working from the outside, trying to mold us and shape us. And God's working from the inside to, to transform us. And that, that literally is the, the word metamorphosis. We are being transformed from the inside out to be more like Christ. That, that's the goal, folks. So my question as we start today is this, and this isn't a trick question, but is change possible? I have a dear friend that asked me many, many years ago. In fact, he didn't ask me. He told me. He said, you don't really believe that, that we can change. I mean, we are who we are. You can't really change. Now, how do you... And this was a Christian friend of mine. How do you answer that question? Can we change? That's the key question. How much transformation have you experienced? I am well into my 70s. And there are still flaws. I still make mistakes. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't. Some things I say, and my wife looks at me like, uh, I can't believe that came out of your mouth. <laughs> Sometimes I do things that I shouldn't. But I can tell you right now, and I have known Jesus Christ for almost, no, almost 50 years. Almost 50 years. I'm not the same man I was 50 years ago. And if you would have known me 50 years ago, you would have asked me to come preach this morning. <laughs> Change is possible. So how do we do that? Many Christians, this is their method. I'm going to try. And I'm going to try hard. And I fail. So, I'll, I'll try harder. And I fail. I'll try even harder to do good. And I fail. And finally, what they do is, I'll try hard to do good. And if I don't make it, I'll fake it. Let me be the first to tell you, in case you don't already know, the Christian life is not difficult. It is impossible. You can't do it. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Too often, I see Christians who are living for God's approval rather than from God's approval. And there's a world of difference. Let me restate that. Many Christians live for God's, I'm going to do good so that God will accept me, rather than living their lives from God. God loves me. He approves of me in Jesus Christ. Now I can go out and I can live the life. Living from God's approval. One of the, the reasons that Paul in the Bible, Paul the Apostle, is fascinating to me is that he experienced the kind of transformation that I want to experience. He was a man who, who persecuted the, the early Christian church. He was, in the Jewish religion, he was a man above all men. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He had been indoctrinated into the law of God. He was an expert on the law of God. He was a PhD in the law of God. But he didn't know the true God. And then he met Jesus Christ. And everything was changed. He found a, a, a salvation, a righteousness with God apart from the law, and, and don't hear me wrong, the law 
is a good thing. And it has its purpose. It had its purpose. But Paul found a faith apart from the, the works of the law. You hold the mirror of God's word up to Paul's life and, and you see this guy who wrote most of the New Testament and you think, that's the guy I want to be, right? And listen to his words from Romans chapter 7. He says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died in the commandment, which was to bring life, I found it brought death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy. The commandment, holy and just and good, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not, but sin. Oh, no, certainly Paul didn't sin, right? But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I am sold on... Paul, are you kidding me? You are sold under sin? Yep. And then he goes on, he says, for what I do, I don't understand. For what I will to do, I want to do good, I want to live for God, I want to obey God, that's what I want, but that's not what I do. That I don't practice, but what I hate, sin, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but that sin dwells in me. Whoa. What do you do with that? You can't rest on that. You have to know that, that this same guy also wrote these words, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, he said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When I was a kid, I loved, I still love cars. I love cars. And my dad and I were drag racers. Um, Michigan is the perfect place to be a drag racer. There are drag, drag strips on every street corner. And if it wasn't, we drag raced on the street. And my dad and I, we built race cars. And we would take these cars that were wore out and we'd make them like new. And that like new. Christ doesn't tweak lives. He doesn't make them like new. He makes them brand new. I want to be new. I want to change. But I experience Romans chapter 7 over and over again. That what I, which is what I want to do, I find hard to do. That which I hate, that just comes natural. Sin. And I want, Paul, I want the rest of the story. And if he left us there in Romans chapter 7, we would be in trouble. But he didn't. If you are following me, and I haven't made it easy to do this morning, but if you are, look at Romans chapter 8. His tone changes in Romans chapter 8. He says in verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. Listen, folks, our flesh is weak. That's why Christians that say, I'm going to just try to do, and I've done that, haven't you? I'm going to try to do the right thing, and, and it's called white-knuckle Christianity. I'm just going to give it my everything. I'm going to really work hard at it. And you're doing good, and you've controlled yourself, you've been patient, and then all of a sudden your wife makes chicken for lunch, and you lose it. Now, I know there's some of you out there, some of y'all, you love chicken. Chicken is for Sunday dinner only. <laughs> the rest of the week should be dedicated to beef. It's what's for dinner. I'm just saying. There is nothing in the world like a good cheeseburger. I could eat a cheeseburger every day, never get tired of it. And then you just lose it over chicken? Really? Terry, I thought you were a Christian. And it comes down to verse 5 in Romans chapter 8. For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. We have two ways to live in this life, folks, either controlled by our sinful flesh or controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. This is what I choose. I believe with all my heart that the Bible promises change. I believe with all of my heart that change has already happened for each and every one of us. So what's the problem? Um, I think many of us live a passive faith. Growing up, I remember that there was a league of, of baseball players who weren't quite professional. We have the major leaguers. And, and I don't know about you, but when I, I look at baseball, the Colorado Rockies didn't even exist. It was all about two teams, one in the American League and one in the National League. Now, growing up where I did, um, this was kind of a, an anomaly, but my favorite team of all time is the New York Yankees. Mantle and Ruth and... and Moose Gowron and Elston Howard and some of these names you're thinking, who in the dickens are those guys? Well, they were Yankees. But really, growing up in Michigan, just 60 miles from the city of Chicago, and I'm sorry, Doug, I don't know if you're a Tiger fan or not, but it was all about the Cubbies. <laughs> Ernie Banks and Ron Santo and... But there was another league of ball players. They were minor leaguers. They were, may I say, semi-professionals. They weren't quite there. They were here semi. And I think there is a classification of semi-professional Christians who live a passive faith. And let me explain that. They go to church on Sunday. They sit still and they listen to a sermon for an hour or two. They sing songs of the faith. They nod their heads in agreement. They assume that their agreement equals faith. And then they go home and they live their lives like they always did with no change. That, my friends, is a passive faith. It keeps people in touch with cultural Christianity, but it doesn't change lives. I don't want a Sunday morning faith. I, will, I want a faith that works on Tuesday morning when my world falls apart and I get bad news that I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I want a God that I can turn to and know that he is going to answer and that he's going to walk me through everything that happens to me that he is going to give me victory in every situation. That's the kind of faith I want. That's the kind of faith that, that God offers to each and every one of us. Folks, we settle for so little. We settle for less. We settle for 
a new car, a, a remodeled house, a bunch of new toys, smart, well-behaved kids, better vacations, and I'll be happy with all of that. And listen, folks, none of those things are bad things, right? But there's so much more. Jesus gave a much different message to us. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things, all of these peripheral things will be added to you. And what we find really in reality is that they're not that big a deal anymore for us. Are we, are you, seeking God? Are you following hard after Christ? I, I don't think any of us intentionally separate our, ourselves from, from God, but do we understand Bible truth? Do we understand how to apply God's truth to our lives? I, I think often we Christians, we fit Paul's words from 2 Timothy 3, 5, where he says that they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. So again, I ask you the question. Do you believe that God can change your life? John 5, 6, Jesus saw a man lying by the, the pool of Siloam. And he knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time. And he looked at that man and he said to him, do you want to be made well? You know, folks, that's a pretty state, straightforward question. It doesn't require a conversation. It requires a yes or no answer. Ladies, do you ever get frustrated with your husband and, and you ask him a question, hoping to open a dialogue with him, and he answers everything you say with yes or no? Jesus wasn't looking for a dialogue here. He wanted a simple answer. Do you want to be made well? Sick man answered him. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus wanted a yes or no answer. This guy had excuses. Do you want to be made well? Jesus isn't looking for excuses from us either, folks. Do you want to be made well? And I'm talking about spiritually, not physically. Do you want to be made well? Yes or no? Jesus said to him, Rise up. Take up your bed. Walk. Do you want to be conformed to the image of Christ? Rise up and walk. Follow hard after Jesus. Lest I make this more simple than we think it is, understand that it requires change. And I don't know about you, but for much of us, change is a spooky word. It's a scary word. Change? Really? Change? I don't want to change. I like it just the way it is. And you know what, folks? There are certain things in my life that I like just the way they are. I am 72 years old. I've combed my hair the same way for 72 years. I've worn a mustache for 50 years. And every once in a while I shave it off, but when I do, I look in the mirror and it's just not right. So it has to come back. I like things the way I like them. I just, I just, how do you make old, your oatmeal? 
you make your oatmeal, and you don't use milk. What you do is you make your oatmeal, you melt butter in it, and then you just cover the dickens out of it with brown sugar, right? That is the only way to make good oatmeal, good, healthy oats, so that you can be strong, and it is the breakfast of champions. About a month ago, with the urging of my wife and my oldest daughter, I started making my oatmeal. And what I do now is I put yogurt, unflavored yogurt in it. I cut up berries and some raisins and some nuts. And then I cover the dickens out. No, no. <laughs> I do add a little sugar, though. <laughs> change. That's what God is after, change, transformation. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Okay, folks, who are we? I mean, when we come right down to it, who are we? And this is where it all begins. It's, it's an understanding of who we are. Who are you? You know, I, and I've heard this, this expression for my entire adult Christian life. I am just a sinner saved by grace. Praise the Lord. Well, yeah, praise the Lord. You, oh, let's change a verb there. You were a sinner saved by grace. But what are you now? What are you now? This, this is not rhetorical. What are you? Children of God, thank you. What else are you? If you look at Paul's letters to the churches, he begins them with a word, and that word is saints. To the saints in the city of Ephesus, to the saints in the city of Corinth, to the saints in Philippi, to the saints... In Thessalonica. You know what I am now? Let me tell you what I am. I am a saint who sometimes still sins. But that is not who I am. That is not the definition of Terry Covert. Listen to these verses. First of all, children of God. I am a child of God. Romans 8, 17. If you are children, then you are an heir of God. You are an heir of God. Hallelujah. Yeah, exactly. Ephesians 1 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints. And we could look throughout the whole New Testament and find these concepts over and over again. So, what I'm talking about is changing our mindset. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's changing the mindset to, I mean, folks, listen. If you tell a kid he's a bad kid long enough and often enough, that child is going to think he's a bad kid. And he's going to start doing bad things. And if you tell a child often enough that he's a good kid, He's going to start believing it. He's going to start living like it. So let me tell you, you are a child of God, and he thinks you're a good kid. And he thinks you can do good things because of Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit. So we change our minds. Again, Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renew. Make your mind new, by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has begun a work in us, folks. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 2 of Philippians, verse 12, it says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now let me stop there for just a second. 
be careful how you work it out. Because again, it's not human effort. Okay? Because it goes on in verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you. I don't have the strength to be a good man. Everything in me wants to do naughty things over and over and over again. We were in Casper, driving in Casper, Wyoming. I know Casper isn't a, a metropolis like Denver, but in Casper, Wyoming yesterday, it's not like driving in Cope, Colorado, or even Yuma, Colorado. And I found myself saying something, commenting about some dear person and the way they were driving, I just made a casual comment. I think I may have called them a bonehead or something. I, I don't know. But, but my wife looked at me and said, what? You said something. I don't remember exactly. But it, it's like, okay, she's right. My wife is right. And not only is she right, but she, God is using her to remind me that I don't call people names, right? Um, we had certain rules in our house growing up, and one of the rules is you don't call people names. But how easy it is to get behind the wheel of a vehicle and start calling people names, right? Isn't that funny how that works, folks? It is God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. Our job, folks, our responsibility is simply to cooperate with God in that. I don't know how much time I get but let me wrap this up with a couple of verses. First of all, Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew, that's you and me, folks, the body of Christ, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. <coughs> yeah. To be conformed to the image of his son. God predestined that. That is God's plan for the body of Christ. We need to, God bless you. We need to cooperate with him in that, work with him in that. And then, how do I know if I'm making progress? What is the standard? As, as I look into this mirror of God's word, what am I looking for? Here's what we're looking for. Galatians 5. 22 tells us what the fruit of the Spirit-led Christian life is. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. This one's hard for me. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, Self-control. How are you doing with that, Terry? Some days are good. Some days I have to make an extra effort to listen to my Lord and to the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you have good plans for us. All of your plans for us are good. A changed life, a transformed life, a, a life conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that for each and every one of us. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.